Howdy folks and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Tuesday, January the 24th, 2017. And it is with my great honor and pleasure of welcoming back to the show, Mr. Andy Hoffman, who is the marketing director at Miles Franklin. Andy, welcome back. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Ready to go. Well, let's make it happen. And now that gold is Sharia law compliant and the 1.7 billion Muslims can now own physical gold, a tiny one-tenth of 1% 1 would move the scale on physical gold acquisitions in a way that could, from my perspective, Andy, it could overwhelm the market. How will the physical gold market handle this and what, uh, how could, how will the physical market handle what could be an onslaught of new customers? Well, you are the first person to actually ask me about the new Sharia law on a podcast. So thank you. Yes, that went into effect. I think it was in late December uh, without much fanfare. There's apparently a kind of Sharia law uh, accounting council or investment council which decides which investments are suitable. And generally speaking, they don't like trading vehicles. They prefer uh, real investments. They, I'm not quite sure the nuances, but it's been in, in um, it's been in discussion for some time, and apparently it came out. So uh, there are a lot of new precious metal related investments which are now uh, available to those people who believe in, in Sharia law. And while it won't be all of the Muslims, because most of them don't have money, there are certainly, from the numbers I've read, there are 400 million uh, that that you know are of the means that they may wind up. Um, you know, using this law to buy precious metals. So again, you know, it's, uh, as I've said all along, kind of the uh, unstoppable tsunami uh, of, of, in the case of gold and silver, the supply and demand fundamentals just getting tighter and tighter as more and more people in the world are interested in protecting their wealth uh, against the, the, uh, the, the currencies that are being destroyed. I mean, it's no coincidence that this, that this standard was finally put into place now as the people on this council are watching all these currencies, including a lot of the, the Middle Eastern currencies, be annihilated. And, uh, you know, looking out for themselves, they create ways in which their people can protect themselves. Exactly. I mean, and silver is part of part of this as well. I mean, they've got a they've got a basket of commodities that fall into into this aspect of Sharia law and silver and dates and wheat. And there's a couple of other items that are part of it as well. So all of these items are now on the table and which is good for you. That should be very, I would think that it would impact your business to some degree anyway. I mean, if it's 400 million people, once again, just using the smallest of percentage, which is one tenth of 1%, that's going to move the scale. Uh, you know, it has to. So. Right, and, and and what's going to be the change in the buying of gold and say, and, and especially silver, because people there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of money in India now that this cash ban has all but destroyed the nation. I mean, yeah. I'm talking about this is the end of India. It's irreversible. They've gone back. If they ever were above third world status, they're now deeply into it, and it's going to it's going to get much worse. And uh, and China, where the the devaluation process continues in earnest. You've had these massive capital flows. People are scared. And in China, the government actually encourages you to buy gold. So yep. you know, that's just the eastern part of the world. Then you have the whole Europe. Europe's falling apart. You have, uh, hyperinflation is, uh, is, is, uh, is a distinct possibility in a lot of South America. And of course, you know, we're the end, we're the big end game here. Uh, when, you know, when our inflation finally uh, finds its way into, uh, into infl interest rates and, and investor fears. And as far as what's happening with this change in the gold and silver market, I mean, doesn't this change actually make possible the potential for a true arbitrage to actually manifest in the Shanghai gold futures market? I mean, if the premiums, which have cooled down over the past couple of weeks, if they remain in the mid-teens through the mid $20 per ounce of gold, I mean, wouldn't it be worth taking a couple of uh, hundred ounce contracts off the COMEX LBMA and shipping it into the Shanghai gold futures market? Well, I, I, I'm always skeptical of all these kind of numbers. I mean, I read some smart people like Kuz Jansen and Ronan Manley about 
the reality of all the physical movement on the Shanghai market. Um, I'm, I'm guessing there's some kind of capital controls related to it. And you'd think by now that there would have been a huge arbitrage. Uh, I mean, look, I'm looking at the difference right now. And while gold, the premiums have pretty much gone away and silver, it's still a dollar ten difference per ounce. So you would think that someone would do that. But I just don't think there's a lot of paper selling going on in Shanghai. So I don't, I'm not sure how they can even do that. The, but the, the thing you're going to see is people in the East are going to be trying to buy here. You know, I'm always surprised that you don't have some people in, uh, in the Far East trying to buy silver at, let, at say, Miles Franklin and store it over here. Uh, and, you know, people store stuff over there. Why not store it here? And eventually the people are going to do that. That's definitely going to be an arbitrage, especially if you have capital controls. People are, are knowing there, there's no way of getting uh, the metal into the country, so they're going to want to store it overseas. So I, I got to think at some point, especially in silver, that you're going to see that movement pick up. Yeah, I would, th I would think so, too. Uh, and speaking of silver, uh, the new border tax that President Trump wants to impose, I mean, that could impact silver coming out of Mexico into the U.S. I mean, U.S. imports a great many number of tons silver annually just to satisfy the U.S. Mint. And the doc and Eric Dubin uh, first brought this to the table a couple of weeks ago. And I wanted to get your thoughts about the impact on silver if this new tax is, in fact, implemented. Well, right. The bigger picture is that these, you know, implementing border taxes and tariffs, generally speaking, are bad. I mean, they've never proven to be to be beneficial. And uh, in fact, they were a big reason why we had the Great Depression in the 1930s. And certainly now trying to institute tariffs against countries that I was just saying this in, in a, another podcast. I mean, they're the ones with the cards. Mexico still has a dramatically lower cost of, of production than we do. So if we want to institute uh, tariffs. There's all kinds of things that they can do in response uh, between the currency, which is already getting killed, and and mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and, res and trade barriers in the in in one way, shape, or form. They can get back at us, and of course, a country like China can really get back at us. And they've already said last week, if Trump doesn't stop, we're going to take off the gloves. So uh, I don't really think that that these tariffs are going to help at all. Uh, the U.S. economy. I think it's going to make things much worse for the U.S. and the global market. And as you said, there's all these little, tiny little uh, ramifications, these uh, unforeseen circumstances like, oh, yeah, Mexico is like the biggest silver producer in the world. Right. And uh, we and if we can't get their silver, it's going to cause shortages over here, which is going to make it harder for the powers that be to hold the price of the price down and maintain the facade of this, you know, fairy tale economy, which produces high stock prices, but nothing much uh, aside from that. So, yes, if we institute a trade war or a currency war or any other kind of war with Mexico, it's going to make it more difficult for, for things that we need, like silver, to get across the border. I mean, do you think uh, let, that... Let alone at normal prices. How about a tariff on silver that causes the price of silver to go up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in Mexico, they could do that just as easily, right? I mean, they could yeah. say, well... Any silver that we ship into the United States, it's got, you know, $20 an ounce tax on it. Yeah, I mean, remember silver, that's why, I mean, I'm looking today again, you know, copper's in sink, or they're soaring because Trump's going to do his infrastructure plan because they proposed a billion dollar infrastructure plan, which is so silly because China's been doing the world's biggest infrastructure plan for 15 years. And before Trump came around, copper and zinc and lead were at like we're almost at their lows from the 2008 crisis and yet we're supposed to believe that the modest amount that trump wants to do if he can even do it is going to offset all that the chinese uh, couldn't do for 15 years it's ridiculous but aside from that when i look at these base metal prices go up and i wrote about the well, a month ago i wrote you know the base metal bu bubble versus silver fundamentals three quarters of every, as you know three quarters of all silver production is used for industrial usage Right. Uh, that's why the investment, uh, the amount that's available for investment is always so tight. And unlike a lot of these other things like copper and zinc, I mean, silver, because of its its electrical properties and conducive properties, is the most indispensable uh, metal on the whole periodic table. There's more uses, industrial uses for silver than any commodity other than crude oil. So if you're going to have you know, this big building boom, Silver is going to be needed in the worst way, let alone if you're talking about building boom in electronics aside from infrastructure or the electronics that go inside of the infrastructure. So 
you're talking about there's going to be physical tightness just from that end, let alone if you make it more difficult to get it in the country or you charge excessive tariffs on everything coming in. Yeah, and, and you and you mentioned the uh, trillion dollar infrastructure project that uh, Trump has introduced, and now the Democrats they're they're on board with it. And you know how will how will the con men in Congress? I mean, they they love to spend other people's money. I mean, from where will these funds materialize, Andy? I mean, aren't we already over budget with our spending as it is? I mean, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we, we only had a quote six hundred billion dollar deficit last year, only six hundred billion, <laughs> and yet, and yet, the national debt went up by twice that amount. So, yes. you know, they, they they can make up all the numbers they want, but we still owe the money. And uh, and Trump's plan again, he wants to build things that don't produce revenues. I mean, he could say, "Oh yeah, the roads will have tolls," but the fact is. The return on investment, let alone the time frame, you know, the, of a return on investment on that stuff is it's minuscule and it's uh, it could take forever. And then, of course, a lot. He also wants to build a wall across Mexico and he wants to build up the army. These things, you know, have absolutely no return. They're, you know, they're you know, they're negative cash cows. So you want to spend this money, it's going to make the deficits explode. And of course, you also have again the debt ceiling suspension, which the Democrats pushed into place. Uh, a year and a half ago so that Obama could spend all he wanted and get uh, Hillary into office. Well, that ends on March 15th. So we're going to have to have another debt ceiling um, raise. And uh, so how are you going to do that with all the wrangling in Congress and get through a trillion dollar infrastructure plan that's backed by nothing? And if you do try to back it by something like, you know, cutting spending, well, what's the point? I mean, if you cut one place and increase in another place, you're not stimulating anything. So, you know, to do a pure stimulus, which, again, is just to make a hyperinflationary exercise, which has to be monetized. Again, interest rates will go up, right? Right. They do that, and then someone's going to have to monetize them. Uh, so <laughs> that's just an exercise in, in printing money that has to be financed with the Fed. And so, you know, it's, a, it's an endless circular loop. I mean, these things are not feasible. None of these things he wants. None of these things he wants are even good. And if General Motors was building their plants in America, which they're not going to do, it's just going to make the cost of cars explode higher for a population that has no money to start with. And it's going to invite all the responses in the, in the currency wars and, the, and, and, and from you know, trade from other, from other countries. So, you know, the fact is, at some point, the piper has to be paid. And have, just because Trump is in office and he tweets a lot and he, and he has meetings with auto executives and says, I'm going to bring the jobs back. You know, those jobs are long gone. Heck, robots are taking a lot of the jobs. I mean, that's what they were talking about in Davos. So automation is taking a lot of the jobs that were gone, they don't exist anymore. So what jobs exactly are you bringing back? Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because he has talked a lot about bringing jobs home and there's been some noise about companies making new hires, most of which were already in the works before President Trump was elected. And what I want to know is this, Andy, China is already making huge moves to automate as much manufacturing as possible. Automation is showing up everywhere from cars to waiters and restaurants. I mean, how I see more jobs being lost to technology and automation than being gained from President Trump's call to arms for bringing jobs home. I mean, what do you think? Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, again, the jobs that he brings home are going to be a net negative on society because if, if, it were, if they were even to happen, I'm not, I don't believe any of these are going to happen. But if they were going to happen, it would be at the cost of massive fiscal stimulus and subsidies that are going to cause inflation and higher interest rates. And, of course, the response from other countries and currency wars. And, uh, and they're going to be, of course, they're going to be offset by jobs that are naturally being lost. And it's not just China that's, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, investing in, in, in robotics. It's we are. I mean, we're, yes. we're, I mean the only job category. Uh, that has shown growth since the 2008 crisis is waiters and bartenders. And even that is suspect since you're seeing how bad the, the restaurant industry is doing. And so the only way they're only really, quote, hiring is if they just have more and more part-time employees to replace full-time employees. Uh, so, but they are replacing people too, because why should you pay these, especially these, these, these pushed up minimum wages that are ridiculously uneconomic for restaurateurs when they can have technology that, you know, that, 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 that'll be nothing. I mean, you don't need waiters anymore and you, we're going to lose, we're going to lose hundreds of thousands 
of waiters and bartenders uh, as the years go by as a result. So, you know, it's just kind of like you're in a treadmill. You just like Astro and the Jetsons. You just you're not gaining any ground. You might gain some some publicity and some populism points, especially when you're running against a monster like Hillary Clinton. But you know, it, the reality is not going to change with him there, and it's gonna. It won't be long before everyone realizes the reality can't change, or or worse yet, some of the things he does may wind up causing the negative changes, like surging interest rates because of inflation expectations. Exactly. And speaking of reality, I mean, this morning uh, we learned that December home prices went up four percent versus December 2015. This was the 58th consecutive month housing went up. That's two months shy of five years. Andy, how much longer can the housing bubble, uh, how much larger can the housing bubble become before the truth is actually revealed? Well, in a lot of markets, it already has started to come down, like a lot of the high-end markets that have been real. I mean, it hasn't been a uniform bubble like in 2005 through seven where it was every single place in America. Here it's been the high-end markets. It's where the people have been given the free money, uh, you know, the 1%, the, the central banks and, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the big banks, the Goldmans and the hedge fund, and they've invested in these things on leverage. And uh, all the people that lost their shirts have sold out their houses, and that's why you have so much, so much rent, uh, ownership or own to rent by these guys. Uh, so it's a completely different market, and it's been highly concentrated, the gains in the biggest markets. And those markets are now, I mean, it's quantitatively proven. I mean, the New York, San Francisco, these markets are falling. Uh, so I'm not sure how those averages are calculated, but you know, it seems to me that prices are not rising now. And now that you've had this absolute crash in mortgage applications and refinancing activity because of the uh, rising interest rates uh, that Trumpflation expectations have caused, it's going to make. It's certainly not going to make uh, housing prices go up anymore. So I don't really think housing prices are going up anymore. I don't care what they say, and certainly the headwinds uh, are are not are, are definitely not in their favor at the moment. Or is the Fed going to be able to raise interest rates the way that they have said the last two years? Now we're going to have four interest rates throughout 2017. Are they going to be able to do that? They didn't do no, it last of year. Not. No, the only reason they did it uh, in December was to quote, you know, uh, preserve credibility, or as they wrote, <laughs> preserve credibility when none exists, and also because the bond vigilantes had already taken interest rates up seventy-five basis points. So, in essence, a twenty-five basis point hike was not raising rates; it was in a real basis losing ground to the, uh, you know, to the curve. Uh, and, and you know, the only re the other reason they were able to do it is because they had goosed the stock market with this BS Trumpflation meme, which is ridiculous. I mean, it was just days before his election. In fact, the, the hours that, that he, they thought he was elected, the markets were crashing because yes. of the expectation. Then all of a sudden they decided that it's the greatest thing in the world and it's going to create all this inflation. Uh, it's ridiculous. So, uh, you know, again, what is going on in the markets is going to have to be reversed at some point soon because all that's, all that's hoped is not going to happen. It can happen. And as for, oh, we're talking about the Fed, they can raise rates because Rates going up is what's causing the problem. I mean, uh, raising rates at a time when the rest of the world is easing and when the dollar is super strong uh, is only going to make things worse. And now you have a president who's out. He came out two days ago and said, the dollar is too strong. We need to get it down. And Steve Mnuchin, who's going to be Treasury Secretary, said today the dollar is excessively strong and it has a negative impact on, uh, on the economy. So if you have the two top guys in government, the financial part of the government, wanting a weak dollar, and the fundamental screaming for a weaker dollar because a strong dollar and higher interest rates is utterly killing us. I mean, last week I wrote my 2.5% enough said saying everyone thinks rates are going to go up, but I don't think they can get above 2.5% because every time it gets there, it crashes because it'll kill the economy. So again, who is, who is, you know, who can benefit from higher rates? Nobody. And who is against higher rates? Everybody. So the only reason rates would go up is if we actually have our end game of hyperinflation where everyone loses faith in the dollar all simultaneously, which eventually will happen, but I don't think it's going to happen now because there's so many other lesser currencies that it's happening to first. <laughs> Last question. And what, what role do you see, Andy, with everything that you just explained, which makes perfect sense? To, it makes perfect sense to me. What role do you see 
the SDR or the MSDR playing as people pull away from the dollar? Do you think that the SDR has uh, uh, plays a role at all? Yes. Look, That's all right. I, I agree with a lot of things that Jim Rickard says. Uh, in fact, I highlight a couple of his really good articles today. He wrote one about, uh, you know, will China devalue the yuan again, as I've been talking about, will they do it soon? And I've been talking about how that's very possible, especially if the dollar moves up. And also, he wrote another article, uh, it's called something like Ice Nine, talking about the predicament, uh, you know, the cl- crash in currencies that's going to be coming and how gold will be your safe haven. But as for this SDR, I think it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. And I'm not sure, I mean, maybe he's, in, he was inside the negotiations of it, uh, so he has a special belief in it for some reason. But to believe that a, a basket of currencies, of the very currencies that are crashing that no one wants, is going to be the savior of the world, managed by a bunch of morons like the IMF, uh, it, it's just so, it's so unbelievable. I can't believe anyone would even put a second of thought into it. I mean, they could try to do whatever they want. They could say, hey, we're going we're gonna to create monopoly money. We're going to create a new bank today. We are officially creating... The Bank of of, uh, of of Mars today and, and the United States and England, big tough England and France and Italy and Germany, and uh, they're all going to be a part of it. And we decided we're going to issue a brand new fiat currency and everyone's going to take it. It's ridiculous. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And if we ever got to the point where where his prognostications about the SDR even discussed, I mean, who cares anyway? Your gold will be through the roof. Currencies will crash. And who, who cares about this SDR? It's, I, I see absolutely no chance in the world of any new fiat currency uh, coming to the fore. Well, that's about as clear as it gets right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I certainly appreciate all your time this morning, Andy. And we've been speaking with Andy Hoffman, who is the marketing director at Miles Franklin. And Andy, tell them how they can get in touch with you. Yes, Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 28th year in business, not a single registered complaint. Uh, you can email me at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. You can call us at 800-822-8080 or go to my blog at milesfranklin.com. I write there every day and do podcasts like this, and it's all for free. Well, Andy, certainly appreciate all your time this morning, and I look forward to speaking with you in the not-too-distant future. Same here, Roy. Thank all you. All right, buddy. Have a good one. You too.